Now, then, without further ado, I would like to welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. Becca Webster. Becca was born and raised in Quispensis, New Brunswick. Her first post-secondary degree was a Bachelor of Science in Psychology, which she completed at Acadia University in Nova Scotia. She then moved to St. John's, Newfoundland, where she completed medical school at Memorial University of Newfoundland. She met, met her husband, Dr. Sachin Begmer, during medical school, and the two moved to Peterborough, lucky us, in 2017 to complete their family medicine residency through Queen's University. Becca had been working as a family physician at the medical center with Sachin, but she transitioned to full-time work in palliative care in July, 2021. Becca is now the division head for palliative care at PRHC. She and her colleagues provide palliative care to patients in the community at PRHC and at Hospice Peterborough. Becca is also a board member on our board since 2020. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Becca Webster. Thank you so much, Wendy, for that warm welcome. I am going to share my screen here, which hopefully it will work how I want it to. So if I just... Can everyone see that okay? okay. Yes. Yes, thanks. Okay. So I have the great honor today of just telling you a little bit about palliative care in Peterborough, as well as some of what we experienced during the pandemic. And I've never quite done a talk like this before, um, but I know that uh, it's important to say if I have any disclosures initially. And so I don't really have any financial conflicts at all to report. And as Heine said, uh, my relevant relationship include that I sit on the directors and I'm also now head of division of palliative care at PRHC. Um, as Heine mentioned, my husband, Dr. Sachin Wagmer, um, is pictured there with me, and that's the last picture we took in my family medicine space before uh, I left family medicine and moved exclusively into palliative care. So to give a brief overview, I just want to review palliative care and some of the principles that guide what we do within palliative medicine. I'm going to describe the landscape of palliative care in Peterborough at this time and, and how it's changed during the pandemic and then hopefully provide a bit of, yeah, uh, insight into where we should go from here. So patients and their loved ones will often say to me, I don't know how you do it. How do you do this job every day? Well, I would say that our work is very, very rewarding. And most people associate palliative care with death and dying, but it's not just death and dying. It's, it's much more than that. Patients and their families are often terrified when they hear that I'm going to be involved. And that's just because of my title. I'm not a person who's overly doom and gloom, but they hear palliative and think that there's nothing really left for them. In the community, when I first meet a family, I start almost every visit explaining that yes, end of life care is a big part of what I do, but that's not always the case. Our patients do have life-threatening illnesses, but it's not necessarily the end for all of our patients. So we meet patients wherever they're at in their illness course, and sometimes that's very early on. And if we look at this bow tie model that was developed by Pippa Howley out in BC, you can see that sometimes we play a very minimal role initially, particularly when patients are being actively or aggressively managed by their specialists and with disease modifying agents. But at the core of what we do is, is pain and symptom management. And I had one patient ask me about the origin of the term palliative. So we looked it up together and uh, it's derived from the term palliare, which means in Latin to cloak. 
And so, no, that's not like to cover someone up and help them die. It's to cover up any symptoms they're having or any suffering they're having without necessarily curing the underlying issue, but more so uh, helping to, to modify their experience of that. Um, and then if we kind of look at how palliative care changes over time, we do often take more responsibility for the patient's care over time, particularly if their disease is progressing uh, and they're shifting their care towards full comfort care, end of life care. Um, but on the other hand, someone might stabilize or recover and we, we often stay involved in their care in some way. For those of you who work at, at hospice, you know that I've had one patient for my entire career and that's only three years, but, but still, I think that's uh, you know, very helpful for patients to know that it's, it doesn't have to be the end when we get involved. So our job in palliative care goes well beyond the management of, of physical symptoms. And we become completely intertwined in our patients' lives and get to know them for who they truly are. They're not just a person with cancer or lung disease or whatever illness they happen to have. They have a past, they have beliefs, they have a community of people around them and they have a wide variety of needs. And so we help to relieve suffering in many different ways from finding safe living arrangements to helping financially with forms for their family to be off work, to take leave or making sure that medications are cost effective for them. Um, on a lighter note, people worry about their animals and what they're going to do when they're sick. And Dr. Whiting has taken care of birds and cats and <laughs> a variety of different uh, creatures um, to help her patients out. Um, I think she's even found clothing for some of her patients. But anyway, we all do things like that because we truly care about our patients and their overall well-being. And we see them for you know, a whole person and learn about all the things that make them who they are. Um, and in that, we help them have a better understanding of what their illness is. We advocate for them. We help them to come to terms with their illness uh, and just figure things out together over time. So admittedly, I'm, I'm only in my third year as a staff physician, but my job doesn't feel like a job most days. Um, as cliche as it might sound, I think most of us in palliative medicine would say that it's a bit of a calling and we're really passionate about the work that we do. Um, it, it can indeed be really sad at times. I, I cry with my patients. I don't think that caring for younger patients is, is ever gonna get easier. Life's just not fair sometimes, right? But palliative care and focusing on quality of life and symptom management, it's actually considered a basic human right. And it's very, very, rewarding to do the job that we do. I don't think in any other field of medicine do we get thanked to the same degree that we do in, in palliative care. And people are just forever grateful for what we're able to do for their loved ones as they navigate their life-threatening illness or uh, start approaching end of life. And it's really just you know a great privilege to be with people. I've been with many people as they take their final breaths and to only be you know, one of a few people there with them at that time is, is just, yeah, it's hard to put into words. So in Peterborough, this is our, our palliative care physician team. Um, the group has changed a lot over the years um, and we're currently a, great, a group of eight physicians. So there we have Dr. Whiting, Dr. Mallory, Dr. Morelli, Dr. Beamish, Dr. Matheson, Dr. Heidman, myself, and Dr. Blake. And there in the center is Sherry Mosser, who was retiring from her job as a, a nurse consultant at PRHC. But so we receive referrals for our patients in community and in hospital. And of course, as I said, we sometimes are getting involved in patient's care very, very early on. So we're following a variety of people in, in various stages of life-threatening illness. And we really strive to provide good continuity of care between home hospital and hospice. And so we round on our own patients every day at the hospital or at hospice. 
Um, and then we provide home visits on a daily basis. We have on-call funding through a program called CPOC or Community Palliative On-Call, which allows us to provide 24 seven access to a palliative physician. And so we all take calls for our own patients from eight to five every day. Um, but then whoever's on call will cover for weekends, evenings, holidays, and for whenever someone's away. So we have many different community partners, but within my line of work, they're kind of these three main areas. Um, for the past few years, Hospice Peterborough has helped uh, accept all of the referrals in the community and Amy Watson's our intake coordinator and she helps to facilitate assessments uh, by one of our palliative nurse navigators initially. And those navigators help to gather information, provide education to patients and their families and really get the ball rolling with their care. And if they've been referred to a specific physician, then we see them or they'll go to whoever is available first. Um, and then we provide care at home for, for most of our patients with the help of various agencies through Home and Community Care Support Services, formerly known as the LIN. Um, and the main agency we work with in regards to home care would be St. Elizabeth's or SE Health. And they have access to PSWs, nursing staff, occupational therapy, and so on. And um, home care really helps to provide access to equipment, hospital beds, walkers, you know, whatever they may need, including medications. And then the nurses within the homes can, of course, help with any expected deaths in that setting. And they pronounce patients uh, when, they, when they die, as long as they have in order to do so. And then in hospital, we have a, a palliative care unit with 28 beds and we directly admit our patients there and they get to bypass the emergency department as long as their goals of care are consistent with, you know, care for on, care on our unit, as well as, you know, if we have a bed available. But any new referrals in hospital are only seen by a palliative physician if their goals of care are consistent with a more palliative based approach. And so we do provide treatment for potentially reversible illnesses. We even give IV antibiotics, involve other specialists, but if they want very, very aggressive management or ICU level care, they're best cared for on a different unit. But of course we want early involvement of palliative care, right? We wanna be there. We want to ensure that everyone's receiving access to symptom management and ensuring their quality of life is as good as it could possibly be. And so just this past week, we rolled out a new position at the hospital, um, a palliative nurse practitioner. And so that's replaced the role of the palliative nurse consultant uh, in the hospital. And it just provides us more of an opportunity to prescribe medications, facilitate goals of care discussions and see things through a palliative lens. And so it's really just helping to ensure that people can access palliative care, even when their goals are still really active, even if you know, they're not on our unit. Um, we want everyone to receive the best care possible. And then of course, if we circle back to hospice, which I think we all know well, and that's why we're here today, but our residence has 10 beds and it's an incredible place to be. Um, it's for patients who are in their final weeks of life um, or perhaps up to a few months of life at most, but uh, it's not a place where people go for respite care or anything of the sort. Um, but beyond the residents, of course, we have a variety of services uh, for those experiencing life-threatening illness and grief. And it's really a community of providers well beyond physicians. So during the pandemic, we've seen a number of changes and I'll start with some changes to the work that the physicians have done. And it's kind of hard to remember everything that changed because it's been a long few years, but during the peaks of the pandemic, um, or at least a few of them, we had a palliative care response team at PRHC that Dr. Whiting helped to, to coordinate. And it consisted of a physician, a nurse consultant and a social worker. Um, and we had two call schedules going at any one time. So that one physician was kind of on for the unit and community. And then another physician was uh, in throughout the hospital, kind of doing the work that the nurse practitioner is going to be doing now. But of course, much of that was 
work related to COVID-19. Um, there were times when we didn't allow patients with COVID-19 to be on the palliative care unit. So the palliative physician would go to the specific COVID unit and provide care there along with um, any other physicians involved in their care. And we helped to facilitate intensive goals of care discussions to really sort out what they wanted for their care moving forward. And there was a big push for this at times when we were at great risk of resource scarcity and, and needing to triage who was going to receive care and who wasn't. And so if there were people that you know, could be receiving a more comfort-based approach to their care rather than going to ICU, that was almost encouraged at times. And so we tried to navigate those discussions the best we could with, with patients and their families, but it was very, very challenging. Um, at one point, um, or for a little while, I guess, Dr. Beamish was the only physician providing care at Hospice Peterborough. And that was really in an effort to minimize exposure within the buildings from all of us uh, who were still continuing home visits on a daily basis or being exposed to COVID-19. And we wanted to protect the residents at hospice and ensure that you know we didn't end up with an outbreak on our hands, which there were some, yeah, situations that, that came up, but we really did the best we could. Um, in regards to virtual care, that became a huge part of not only our work, but all, all healthcare providers work. And Dr. Erin Nishikawa and Dr. Natalie Whiting, um, so Erin is one of our current residents and she did a project on um, how practices might've changed during the pandemic. And it became clear that really like we never stopped doing in-person visits. And maybe we were some of the only physicians doing that at times when even their oncologists didn't see them or some of their you know, specialists, but we were going into their home still and seeing them. But we did supplement our visits with home visits whenever possible, um, again, to kind of minimize exposure. I think one of the most challenging things of the pandemic has been visitor restrictions. And like even at home, patients weren't really able to see their loved ones in the same way because of just general community public health guidelines, right? And social distancing and not being able to travel. People didn't have their communities of people. And in palliative care, it's such a team-based approach to care. We need their families around, but we just couldn't at times. And so it was hard to restrict it to patients as well who were approaching end of life. Like we would be a little more flexible as people were actively dying. But as we know, you wanna be with the people you love while you're still able to interact with them, while you're still able to have conversations, while you're still able to enjoy those visits. But um, it really, like our hands were a bit tied, so to speak. And then for those who were unlucky enough to be diagnosed with COVID-19, whether they were on or off the unit um, at the hospital, because they weren't going to hospice at all, it really impacted their visitation significantly. And family members, of course, were close contacts and then couldn't come into the hospital. And that was absolutely devastating for so many people. I had one patient who was dying from a metastatic malignancy at home, and she just couldn't have her care needs met at home anymore. And so she came into hospital and unfortunately, because she had some respiratory symptoms, she was tested for COVID, happened to be positive for COVID and then couldn't be with her family, right? Like her kids couldn't come see her as she died. Her husband couldn't even be there initially until she was actively dying. And that was the reality for so many of our patients where it, it just shouldn't have to be that way, but it, but it was. Um, it was also really challenging to communicate some of those rules to families, but also just communicate about, you know, a patient's health and what was going on. They couldn't be at the bedside all the time they, or, or it was limited to who could be there. And so we as care providers, you know, called uh, patients' families more readily, but that was time consuming. And it was also challenging to play phone tag and it's hard to kind of convey a message over the phone but 
anyway, and we would also, of course, do virtual visits for, for patients to see their families, but it just really wasn't, wasn't the same. If we go back to this concept of, of total suffering in the peak of restrictions, they're providing, you know, management of physical symptoms that was only really like a small part of, of what we do. Like we just couldn't do all of the other aspects of care that we so wish we could or that we normally would in pre-COVID times, let's say. Like people were depressed. They couldn't see their family. They couldn't be involved in their normal uh, cultural uh, engagements or, you know, spiritual uh, events, so on and so forth. It was just really, really challenging. Um, I think at hospice in particular, like we've done the best we could for every single patient. And I know it was really trying at times when like, it seemed like we could never do anything right. Like some families would just, you know, one more visitor, we've brought the grandkids, we've done whatever, and just really trying to push, push, push. When we understand all we are trying to do is provide the best care we could, but yeah, it was challenging. And I, at hospice, we did have a slightly more flexible visitor policy than the hospital at times. At the palliative care unit on D2, patients or patients, loved ones can't go up to the window. So um, at least at hospice in, in many of those rooms on the courtyard, we could provide window visits and push the bed right up to the window and open the windows and, and have people there. And no, maybe they couldn't touch their loved one, but they could see them, they could hear them, they could get some of those other senses, right? That are so important to that sense of togetherness. And I think at hospice more than anywhere else, we provide incredible personalized care. The, the staff give each patient or their families like a little handout trying to get them get to know them better. So figuring out what foods they like, what TV shows they like, what kind of music they listen to, who's in their family, um, who do they love, and just, you know, gathering some of that information, reminiscing about times past, and just really getting to know them. And they, the sense of community at hospice has really been maintained throughout the pandemic, even when it didn't feel as great as we would like it to be, it was still there. And, and yeah, it was such a, a great place for us to be as providers as well. In a time when patients were really losing their sense of autonomy and, and losing sense of control as their disease progresses, at least at hospice, we, you know, gave them some sense of control in each day, right? When did they want to eat? What did they want to eat? What, do they want to have a bath today? Do they want to paint their nails? Do they want like just all the little things that add up to mean so much that, yeah, it, it's it, just incredible the level of care that we can provide at hospice and it's a real asset to our community. To just reflect on some other changes that we experienced during the pandemic, um, of course, patients were trying to avoid hospital at all costs, um, not just if they were dying, but, and because of the visitor policy, but because they were scared of getting COVID and they just didn't wanna be in that environment. And so we did what we could in terms of increasing home-based palliative care, but that was challenging at times with staff shortages in the community, like our St. Elizabeth nursing staff, we're trying to get around to, you know, over 20 houses a day, which is more than the physicians would do even, right? But like they could only do so much and we really did what we could, but it put more strain on, on families and caregivers and they were isolated as well. So they had decreased supports or fewer supports or resources to kind of tap into. Um, even like our hospice volunteers, for example, like that was cut back. There were so many things that were just taken away from, from families and patients. And yeah, it was really challenging. Um, in regards to staff, some of us were isolating at times. Um, at hospice in particular, Jeanette Godlover was really struggling to get staff at times with, you know, 
uh, nurses working in more than one setting. So working on an outbreak unit, like this has still been happening in the recent past as well, right? But you have an outbreak unit at the hospital, so they can't come and work at hospice because they can't expose everyone else or they're home with their sick children. And it's just been kind of everywhere. And we've all been scrambling at times to support each other. Um, but then also, yeah, not being able to spend time with one another and bond in the same way that we normally would. That sense of togetherness um, has really been missing at times. And even our multidisciplinary rounds at the hospital, like we haven't done those in quite some time. Normally we have members from, you know, home care and hospice and everyone's there and communicating and in person and discussing cases and figuring things out together. But that really um, wasn't possible for uh, most of the pandemic. And then with PPE, of course, there were shortages of that at times, but then communication difficulties. I mean, to be wearing a mask, and a lot of our patients of advanced age have issues with hearing and vision. And so not only are we depriving them of, of you know, things around them or people around them, but were their senses were, um, yeah, they just, they couldn't read our mouths. They couldn't do different things that, you know, having such challenging or emotional conversations, they're a bit fragmented at times. And um, that, was, that was really, really hard. Uh, medication and supply shortages, that's been even an ongoing issue now. We've needed to uh, learn about some medications that we wouldn't normally prescribe or kind of prescribe them in, in different ways because we've run out of things like Nozanan or now like hydromorphones on back order again. Like there's so many different things that we use or we're so used to using to provide symptom management <clears throat> but we haven't been able to to gain access to them and then of course people have just been grieving differently in times of covid um, they've been isolated they haven't been able to have their standard you know funeral services or whatever it may be that's part of the grieving process um, and again, that sense of community has been very fragmented at times. Hospice has continued to try to do virtual groups and, you know, we're finally getting back to in-person now, which is really, really important, but there's such a strain of people who are just not okay, um, are missing their loved ones, never really got an opportunity to grieve, um, so on and so forth. I think you know, not only with visitation, but just in general, the pandemic's been really hard on healthcare providers in terms of trying to make decisions that are right. And so we've been faced with moral dilemmas on a regular basis, which would be, you know, two ethical values that are conflicting. And so do we follow a public health policy or do we allow our patients to have visitors and provide that holistic care that we're so used to providing um it it again it never felt like we were doing the right thing no matter what we decided you always heard about it in some other way or you felt guilty for doing something and even now i mean a lot of us are burned out or experiencing moral residue or whatever we want to call it but just this ongoing psychological impact of being unable to do some things because it's just beyond our control and yeah colleagues needing to take time for themselves right we need to do that um but then like you're not also helping your your colleagues in some ways and so it's this constant pulling in multiple directions of where you should be and this is just you know in regards to what we should be doing for our patients. We all have our own families. We all have our own things to be tending to. And it's been very, very trying at times. I won't talk about this, you know, at great length, but I think there have been quite a few diagnostic delays from the pandemic. And we will see more and more of this as time goes on, I think. This headline is in regards to cancer diagnoses being delayed 
um, just because screening wasn't happening, right? Like we weren't doing mammograms, we weren't doing colonoscopies, we weren't doing a lot of these things. And so cancers that would normally be detected in earlier stages are being picked up perhaps a bit later on. And it gets really challenging to provide palliative care in those scenarios when you're, yeah, forcing people to make decisions sooner than, than they ever would want to have to. And it's just been heart wrenching to, to see people presenting with uncontrolled chronic illnesses, not even just malignancy, but like people haven't gone to the hospital and now there are so many backlogs and the hospitals are just full of people who are sick, um, psychologically and physically, because it's just been, you know, a rough two years and, and not getting access to care, not seeing patients with all of our senses, right? And, and diagnoses just, yeah, being delayed, unfortunately. I think, you know, it's hard to really advise, you know, our group how to move forward from here. And I don't have, you know, the best insight in this because I think we're all still struggling to figure out how to move forward. Um, the pandemic is still here. Like it's not over, it's still ongoing. And we're just constantly trying to find our new normal. But I think we have to just recognize that it's been challenging, continue to show each other compassion, try to, now that restrictions are lifting a little bit more, you know, trying to find that sense of community again, trying to get back to being a multidisciplinary group and, um, finding that sense of, of togetherness. I, yeah, I think that most of my career has been in a pandemic. So it's kind of hard to remember what palliative care was like to a certain extent before this all started. But I think it's just all the little things like sitting down with patients, getting on their level, holding their hands, things that we were scared to do earlier on in the pandemic, especially pre-vaccine, right? I lost some of that um, physical touch and caring that we're just so used to, to doing. But I think just supporting one another and, and finding ourselves once again is, is all we can really do. Um, and I won't keep talking because there are just so many things I could say, but I thought I'd give just a brief overview of, of what it's been like in our community. And um, I welcome any, any questions or comments, but of course we have many other things to talk about in regards to hospice. So thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Becca. Are there any questions? Uh, no. Hello. I have a one, it's Margaret. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, Becca, that was an absolutely amazing presentation. Uh, I don't think I've ever heard a better one um, around palliative care. No, seriously, <laughs> and you know my background. Um, a better one around palliative care. I thought you, you really demonstrate a lot of compassion and commitment, and that really comes across in a very strong way. I think you've also done, um, you really got to the heart of how challenging this whole pandemic was within the healthcare system in general. And uh, I really, really nailed it relative to the moral distress faced by not only healthcare providers, but actually family members as well, right? And uh, and over the last while, I've talked to many uh, healthcare people who've talked, who've um, demonstrated that moral distress and being having to enact on policies that they may or may not agree with. So I think there's a lot of recovery needed uh, across the system. Um, so it, uh, it was heartfelt. It was really, truly an amazing presentation. My one question, though, or, or comment is I'm aware of, uh, I mean, during the pandemic, there was a lot of reactive rules put in place, right? A lot of, and I can understand it. And there was that dilemma around uh, public health, but, and, and all of those things. But 
is there, I know in long-term care, there is a revisit to all of those uh, restrictions around if this ever happened again, how can we do it or, and manage both, you know what I mean, sides of it, public health, as well as the needs of patients and families and healthcare providers in a way where there's more balance. And uh, so without reacting, is, is there any dialogue around if this ever happens again, how we're gonna do it differently? And um, ensure that as you described, uh, some people don't die alone and they don't die with the presence of their family. I mean, there's, as I mentioned, this is an issue across the system, but is there anything happening in hospice? Uh, as I know there is in long-term care around, now that we have time to reflect and think about it, what would we do differently and what will we do differently if this happens again? That's an excellent question. I think um, I don't necessarily sit on some of the meetings that Honeywood or Jeanette and, and some of the other managers, of course, so I'm, and John Beamish being um, medical director would be closer uh, to some of those conversations. But at a hospital level, and as far as I know at hospice, I don't think we've been having some of those conversations. And you raise an excellent point that we should be, right? Some of it's um, forced upon us from government level of what the restrictions will be. And it's hard to know what that will look like moving forward. I, yeah, I don't think we've necessarily had those conversations, but we should, you're very right in saying that. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you, Margaret and Becca. Any other questions from anyone? No. Well, then I would like to thank you, Becca, also for this fantastic presentation. It was, even for us who are at hospice, it's so good to just see and revisit everything at one place and together and, you know, relearn about our system and about, about our challenging. And also thank you for everything you have done and you are doing for hospice and for our clients. It was, it was really an honor to have you as our keynote speaker today. <laughs>